I mean, the basic issue is that we understand much better how migration starts and amplifies itself than how it comes to an end. And this has been mentioned in, in, in the literature many times, so this is not a new observation. I think what is lacking is more systematic insights in under which conditions do we see migration systems and migration networks uh, decreasing in power, undermining themselves and coming to an end. And I think that is the heart of the matter also of the Themis project, trying to sort of uh, uncover some of these dynamics and understanding under what circumstances do we see a continuation, amplification of migration, under what circumstances do we see that they either don't take off at all or uh, weaken over time. So I think we can distinguish four major research gaps. The first is why do migration systems emerge, but particularly why don't they emerge, the counterfactual? Because we all focus on the dependent variable in a way, the migration systems that do work. Most research projects are on the big migration corridors like Turkey, Germany, or Mexico, US, or Morocco, France, for instance. We don't tend to look at empty corridors, for instance. And in the Themis project, we had extensive discussions in how are we going to study empty corridors if there's hardly any migrants. The second one is how do established migration systems break down? Um, how did it come to an end? The third one is how do contextual mechanisms of feedback affect access to migration resources? And this goes into this set of theories that uh, Doc Messi coined as cumulative causation. It goes beyond the networks. It tries to look at how does migration affect broader change in sending and receiving community and how has that follow-up impact on later migration? But I think the most underexplored question, where only now papers are starting to emerge trying to address this question more systematically, is how do these sort of meso-level dynamics of migration networks and systems interact with macro-level change, particularly migration <coughs> control? And I was happy to see there's several papers at this conference <coughs> that try to address these issues now, like how, for instance, have migration restrictions impacted upon the working of migration networks and migration systems, and particularly how have they affected patterns of inclusion and exclusion. In other words, how do they interact with patterns of inequality? So there's more and more data available that enable us to start answering some of those questions, but still significant gaps remain. Now I think to start it's important uh, to make a clear definition, uh, to make clear what, is, what are we talking about. I mean, when Mabagunye um, sort of tried to define what a migration system is, he talked about sets of places, and other people who've applied it to international migration talked about sets of countries that are linked by flows, not just of people, but also good services and information. And that those flows tend to reinforce one another in both directions. And this brings us even back one century earlier to Ravenstein, who said each migration flow generates its counterflow. So it has some sense of systemic interconnectedness between communities between societies, which tend to reinforce subsequent movement. So migration in one direction is likely to engender a counterflow in the opposite direction, but also information, goods, ideas. So we see a systematic interconnectedness between places. Now, network dynamics is just a subset of those dynamics. I think this is very important to stress. And we talk a lot about networks, but migration system dynamics, as has been addressed in cumulative causation, address a much wider set of changes affected by migration which impact upon subsequent migration. Now, the first point, how do migration systems come about? I think if we look at the total number of migration corridors in the world, which is over 50,000, 225 times 225, we see that most migration is concentrated in a very, very small number of corridors. Um, over half of the migration corridors, so the dyadic, dyadic connections of, 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 of countries, is filled. But in less than 300 corridors, we find about 73% of all international migrants. This is only a half a percent of all corridors in the world. We see a big concentration of migration in just a few corridors. And these tend to be the corridors that we all study. We don't look at the rest, generally. And again, the Themis project has started to also look at small corridors, like Moroccans to Norway, to give an example. And I think it was one of the innovations. Now, we sort of understand from the literature on cumulative causation, but also economists talking about herd effects, why migration tends to cluster. And even Mabagunya has talked about this, because <coughs> places which have an initial sort of advantage in terms of the opportunities and sort of positive information flowing back tend to gain a competitive advantage over other potential destinations, which lead from a community level of the clustering of migration to particular destinations. So we see a highly specialized pattern 
emerging from communities linked to very particular destinations um, in, in, uh, in receiving countries. So this idea of spatial bundling of migration flows isn't new at all and was very well described by <coughs> demographers and geographers decades ago. Um, the other question, how and under which conditions do migration systems break down, again, it's not something totally new. I mean, Anita Bucker in 1984 talked about the bridgeheads and the gatekeepers. Also, Messi et al. in their article talked about there is a sort of fundamental flaw with these theories because it seems that migration goes on forever. They don't give a sort of explanation under which conditions does this not happen and do migration systems come to an end. And I think the main lesson from more and more survey and interview-based research coming out of surveys like the Mexican Migration Project, this Temis project, but also other new data sets coming available like EUMagine here in Europe and MAFE project on migration between Africa and Europe, all which all focus on the nature of networks, the sort of assistance they'd be able to provide and the sort of selectivity of the assistance they provide. Both, I think, all these projects more and more seem to show that migration help doesn't occur naturally and is always selective. And in a way that this idea of migrants becoming from bridgeheads to gatekeepers is in a way a false dichotomy. They are both to different degrees. And it may well be that under constraining conditions, they take on more of a gatekeeping role over time. But the idea that migrants will always help anybody coming over is obviously highly naive. I think a key question is to what extent do networks lead to an equalizing diffusion process in communities? Because that's been the idea, that initially from rural communities in poor countries, it's a relatively well of the migrate. But their migration experience is lowers the thresholds for other, lowers the risks and costs of migration, which will then enable other community members who are poorer to migrate. So the idea is of diffusion across communities. Now, whether that happens um, and, and to what extent networks become important, I think depends on two crucial factors. The first is a relative dependence of migrants on social capital in order to migrate. So migrants who have, potential migrants who have limited access to other forms of capital, human capital, material financial capital, are by nature sort of more dependent on social capital to migrate. And several surveys have shown, uh, both econometric and survey based, on um, econometric uh, analysis using macro data and survey based data, that low skilled, poor migrants tend to much more to cluster and tend to be much more dependent on networks to migrate. But another factor is the level of homogeneity and openness of groups. So here the relevance uh, uh, of class, ethnic <coughs> and other social cleavages is very important. And for instance, Portes has argued in his contribution on the downsides of capital that strong group links are good for group members but tend to exclude non-group members. And I think this is a fundamental notion if we think about how migration system dynamics and network dynamics affect inequality. I think a third gap has been the one-sided emphasis of the literature on networks. Even looking at the conference papers, the vast majority of conference papers talks about the networks. There's only, I think, four or five papers that look at the broader context. And, oh yeah, to, to, to show what I mean here, and, and I, let, let me take one example, which was, I think, mentioned in Messi's article on community causation. So we have the sort of first order effects. They, they are really intermediate in migrant groups. So here we see the migrant networks. We see remittance funded migration. We see transfer of migration related <laughs> information. But there's many other effects that affect subsequent migration. Particularly when we think, just let's take one example, remittances. It's well known from the literature that remittances that are sent back can increase inequality be between families and households who have access to international migration and those who haven't. Now this can lead to increasing feelings of relative deprivation. It affects the income distribution for in communities and can increase people's <coughs> desire to migrate themselves. And this is just one example of the many contextual feedbacks that is really beyond the network that can affect people's aspirations to migrate, for instance. And these are generally discarded from analysis on how migration continues itself, but are really crucial, <coughs> particularly when we're interested in issues around inequality and access to migration. So these contextual effects provide, in my view, the crucial and much sought after um, link between theories on the initiation, impacts, and continuation of migration. Because obviously, 
to give to take this one example on the impacts of an, on, on, on income distribution and relative deprivation in origin communities, this is of course an issue that many scholars who look at migration development have been looking at. And, but at the same time, it's the link of understanding how it then subsequently affects people's capabilities and aspirations to migrate. And I think this sort of contextual uh, environment in which migration takes place, and we talk also about clustering at a destination, which can de generate a demand for particular forms of migrant labor in migrant businesses, for instance. That's another example of how certain migrant community uh, effects can also sustain migration, the transnational demand for marriage partners. And there are many examples in literature, and I just listed a few here, which explain why on the sort of meso-migrant community level, both at the origin and destination, uh, these can continue migration. And this needs to be distinguished from the sort of macro-political context where we, for instance, would locate migration policies or big geopolitical shifts, which obviously also affect migration, but you cannot really make the argument they're directly affected through feedback by migration processes themselves. So, in my view, future research should concentrate on the interactions between those networks and migration system dynamics and broader contextual changes such as policy, and this is really the underexplored um, area of research. <coughs> now, luckily, there are more and more studies, particularly drawing on the Mexican migration project data, that have tried to look at how do these contextual changes um, affect inequalities. Feliz Garib, for instance, in a 2012 paper, she observed that in, in high migration communities, increasing, con increasing concentration of wealth among migrants and a growing wealth gap between migrants and non-migrant families occurred particularly in the context of higher constraints <coughs> to migration. And this really reminded me of my own fieldwork in southern Morocco, where I looked at the impacts of, 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 of decades of out-migration to Europe, from the southern Todra Valley uh, to Europe, up on uh, dynamics in origin reasons, regions, not only the impact of, of, of migration on on wealth and, and well-being, but particularly also how it affected the access of non-migrants to potential future migration. And what we've seen here really reminded me of what I've read in, in many other papers, also from Themis, but also from the Mexican Migration Project, that over time from this region, where very intense migration took place both internally, but in particular to Europe, migration hasn't so much dis diminished since the onset of increasingly restrictive migration policies in Europe. Actually, if I go back to this graph and look on the Moroccan level, migration has only increased since 1973. What we have seen, if we look at the regional level, we have seen an increasingly difficult access to migration of relatively poor community <coughs> members. Whereas in the 1960s and the 1970s, for relatively poor Moroccans, it was a relatively accessible option to migrate to Europe because of the lack of border restrictions and the role of active recruitment and access to regular employment in Europe. Migration has become an increasingly selective affair. Migration hasn't diminished from this region and many other Moroccan regions, but the access to migration has been become increasingly monopolized by particular ethnic groups and families in tending communities. This went along with an increasing focus on family migration as a tra best strategy to migrate and led to an increasing sort of group closure of particular ethnic groups that already had access to international migration, but those strong group bonds and this monopolization of access to migration through marriage led to the increasing exclusion of people who did not belong to those groups. And obviously the increasing focus on family migration pushed people more and more into permanent settlement. So we see an increasing closure and reliance on group ties, but also an increased outsider exclusion of those who did not migrate in the 1960s and 70s and their descendants. So what we have seen in this particular region, where in the 1960s and 1970s, so-called Haratin, um, a class of mostly black slave cro uh, sharecroppers and ex-slaves, were able to access migration. In these days, there is a new division between what I've called migration haves and migration have-nots in migration-obsessed communities. And these new migration-driven inequalities have lead to an, led to an increasing gulf between rising migration aspirations, which are not matched by migration opportunities. And here, of course, we have to think about Jürgen Karling's term of rising involuntary immobility in those communities. And we see some groups who don't have access to migration, for instance, to France, who try to look at new destinations like Spain, and some, some of them have found access, but many of them have not.
but we have some <laughs> re sort of orientation of migration flows. And I think we can see many examples of such dynamics from other countries. So let me conclude by a few points. The so what question was asked yesterday, and I think that's a very good question. On the one hand, we all like migration, lar pular, we look at migration, fascinating, and we are obsessed ourselves probably by migration. But I think the so what question is important. Why is this interesting? Now, I believe more and more that a better understanding of the workings of migration system dynamics is crucial, as it can increase our insight in a much broader issue, which is migration and inequality. How do migration system dynamics relate to bigger items affecting the real world around us? And inequality is obviously one of the most pressing issues of these times. And the question that under which conditions migration leads to more or less inequality requires a deep understanding of the ambiguous role of social capital in migration processes. All too often social capital has been seen as the great emancipatory mechanism leading to diffusion. Now we see plenty of examples, whether it's in Mexico, Morocco or elsewhere, where actually access has become more difficult. And the network, yes, serves those within particular families and lineages who already have access because, they, for instance, through marriage or other forms of help, they can get access to migration. The level of inequality within those communities has increased, and a new dividing line runs across um, along access to international migration. And I think this shows the need to move beyond the current obsession with volumes by focusing on inclusionary and exclusionary social mechanisms within these broader migration systems dynamics, in particular how policies affect equality and access to opportunities. And the last slide, I mean, I've been trying to think a little bit and, and also reviewing the literature about how have policies affected access to migration. And I think this is also relevant for the whole migration and development debate. If we think migration restrictions often haven't stopped migration, but what they definitely have done is change the way people migrate, but particularly, and I think this has received less attention, the access to migration as a mechanism of emancipation and betterment of relatively poor people in sending communities. And I think this is a really crucial link. So in that sense, our perhaps obsession with migration systems and migration theories is very important if we do applied research in, in terms of understanding how migration can either alleviate or actually sustain and deepen inequalities in sending societies. Thank you very much.